Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. I recently learned that the same person developed both leaded gasoline and Freon. And those are two substances that are basically banned around the world now because they are both very bad for the environment and for public health. So when I heard this tidbit of information, of course, I thought, holy crap, that guy's definitely getting an episode. And then I didn't write it down. Happens. And I have to write things down. Mm -hmm. So then I got to rediscover that information a couple of weeks later (laughs) and write it down that time. That person's name was Thomas Midgley Jr., and when he died, the destructive effects of leaded gasoline were not fully known. They were somewhat known, and we're going to get to that. Uh, The destructive effects of chlorofluorocarbons, which Freon is one of, they weren't known at all yet. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through Thomas Midgley Jr.'s biography and then we're going to double back to take a closer look at these, those two most notorious inventions of his and how they both came to be taken off the market. Heads up, if you are squeamish about eye injuries, there is one in here that you might want to fast forward through. We'll give a heads up when we get to that. It was too weird and also, to me, too illustrative of the way his mind worked that I didn't want to just leave it out. Uh, Also, Midgley's death may have been by suicide, and we're going to be talking about that. Regardless, though, of whether his death was intentional or not, I also found the details of how it happened to be pretty upsetting. So this is generally an upsetting episode. (laughs) Brace. For a variety of reasons, yeah. Yeah, it's upsetting from multiple directions, for sure. Thomas Midgley Jr. was born on May 18, 1889, in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, to Thomas Midgley Sr. and Hattie Emerson Midgley. Thomas Sr. had immigrated to the United States from England and spent most of his career working in the bicycle, automotive, and rubber industries, developing and improving on things like tires with removable rims. When Thomas Jr. was young, the family moved to Trenton, New Jersey, and then to Columbus, Ohio. He spent a lot of his life in the Columbus area. According to a biographical address about him that was delivered by his colleague Charles Kettering, which may have actually been written by another colleague, Thomas Boyd, Midgley's inventiveness showed itself really early on. He played baseball along with other sports, and when the spitball started becoming more popular, he started trying to figure out the best possible substance to put on the ball. He eventually landed on an extract from the inner bark of the slippery elm tree. Major League Baseball banned the spitball in 1920, so in addition to getting an early start uh, on inventing, Thomas also had an early start with developing things that would then go on to be banned. While attending Betts Academy in Stamford, Connecticut, Thomas took courses in chemistry and really came to love the periodic table of elements. During his career as a researcher, he carried a copy of it with him all the time. After graduating from Betts, he went on to Cornell University, where he got a Master of Engineering in 1908 and a Ph.D. in Mechanical Engineering in 1911. On August 3rd of that year, he married Carrie M. Reynolds, and they eventually had two children, Jane and Thomas. Although Midgley did his most famous work as a chemist, he started out in a job that was more in line with his engineering degrees. He was working as a draftsman and an engineer at National Cash Register Company, or NCR. After he'd been at NCR for about a year, his father asked him to come work at his tire factory, so Thomas Jr. did. And while he was working at this factory, he started to become more interested in cars, He also kept inventing things, including a hydrometer to check whether there was enough alcohol in a car's radiator fluid to keep it from freezing up in the wintertime. So he used two balls, each with a different specific gravity, and if the antifreeze mix was right, one of these balls would sink and the other of them would float. When I read this, I was like, oh yeah, because that's the kind of thing that my dad used (laughs) to show me how to check the radiator fluid when I was a kid. Despite Thomas Jr.'s help, Thomas Sr.'s tire factory eventually closed, so Thomas Jr. needed a new job. While working at NCR, he had become familiar with the work of Charles Kettering. 
Kettering had already left NCR by the time Midgley started there, but he had been the head of the research division and was credited with more than 20 of NCR's patents. After leaving NCR, Kettering had helped found Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, or DELCO, and that's where Midgley decided he wanted to work. He was hired there in 1916, and his first project was another hydrometer. This one built into a battery to show how much charge was left. After that, Midgley was asked to work on a solution for engine knock. We're not going to get into the finer points of what's happening inside various types of internal combustion engines, but basically what was supposed to happen was that a spark from the spark plug would ignite the fuel in the cylinder, and then that fuel would effectively burn all at once. But if some of the fuel ignited at the wrong time, not when that spark was sparking, it would cause an unwanted pressure spike inside the cylinder. And this caused a distinctive, very noisy knocking or pinging. It was also inefficient, and it could cause the engine to lose power. It could damage the engine over time. It was not great for engines. At first, Midgley proposed dyeing the fuel red, thinking that would cause it to absorb more heat and evaporate faster, reducing the potential for knock. He had trouble finding a red pigment that would work for this purpose, so his first attempt was with iodine, which made the fuel more of a brownish black. And that did reduce the knock, but it also would have been too expensive for widespread use. When he found other colorants he thought might work, they didn't. It became clear that the iodine itself, not the color of the fuel, was what had reduced the knock. But then the United States became involved in World War I, and Midgley had to take a break from this project to focus on wartime stuff. During the war, he tried to find a more efficient and powerful aircraft fuel, and he eventually landed on a mix that was about 70% cyclohexane and 30% benzene. The war ended before this could be put into use, which is probably good because benzene causes cancer. Midgley also worked on an aerial torpedo that similarly wasn't used during the war because it wasn't ready in time. During this period, Midgley dealt with an eye injury, and if eye stuff squicks you out, this would be a good time to skip ahead about a minute and 15 seconds. There was a safety plug on a hydrogen tank made of a soft alloy of tin, bismuth, and lead. This plug burst, and tiny pieces of it became embedded in Midgley's right cornea. A doctor removed the biggest pieces, but his eye was peppered with flecks that were just too small to manually remove. This was really uncomfortable, and Midgley started to have problems with his other eye in what felt to him like a sympathetic reaction. So, with his doctor's okay, he tried a treatment that he came up with on his own, which was to use a cup to hold purified mercury against the surface of the eye. Please don't do this at home. He thought the alloy in his eye would amalgamate with the mercury in the cup, which it did. He was able to remove all the debris from his eye with repeated treatments over the course of about two weeks. Mercury is also toxic, but most harmful exposures are through ingestion or inhalation. Yeah, even with that in mind, this just seems... Woo! no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that. I'm not a particularly squeamish about eye stuff, but that crosses a line for me. No, don't, don't do that. Please don't. Don't do that. So once the war was over, Midgley went back to working on the engine knock problem. After various attempts and failures, he started systematically working his way through the periodic table, trying one element after another. He later described this as a fox hunt. On December 3rd, 1921, while working as vice president of General Motors Research Laboratories in Dayton, Ohio, Midgley tried tetraethyl lead. That's a compound that was first developed by German chemist Karl Jakob Loig in 1853. Midgley discovered that three cubic centimeters of tetraethyl lead per gallon of fuel would eliminate engine knock completely. But it also caused lead oxide deposits to form in the engine. He then found that adding ethylene bromide to the mix caused all the lead to be emitted from the engine as exhaust, preventing the buildup problem. But that presented its own issue, which was getting enough bromine. Midgley is credited with solving that problem as well, figuring out a viable way to extract bromine from seawater, where it's present in tiny concentrations, as in 65 parts per million. This idea 
did not come out of thin air. Carl Jakob Loewing and French chemist Antoine Jerome Ballard had each discovered the element bromine around 1825. Loewig had found it in water from a salt spring, and Ballard had used seawater. With a few other tweaks to the formula, the resulting fuel was marketed as ethyl gasoline, and it was first sold to consumers in 1923. We're going to get back into all of that in more detail later. Midgley's next problem to solve was refrigerant gas. At the time, a lot of refrigerants were toxic. They included things like ammonia and sulfur dioxide, so refrigerant leaks could be lethal. And in the 1920s, air conditioning was becoming more popular. We did a podcast on this back in 2018. So there was a lot of demand for a safer alternative. Midgley again went back to the periodic table, and this time he focused on fluorine, specifically dichlorodifluoromethane. This may not have been the first chlorofluorocarbon ever made or the first fluorine-based compound researched as a refrigerant, but it was the first to be widely used and marketed, in this case, under the name Freon. We will also be getting back to Freon again later in this episode as well. In 1940, Midgley contracted polio. Afterward, his body was partly paralyzed, and he started using a wheelchair. From 1940 to 1944, he served as director and vice president of the Ohio State University Research Foundation, and during World War II, he served on the National Research Defense Committee and the National Inventors Council. He did a lot of work with rubber during World War II, including finding vulcanization methods that could help the country deal with a short supply of rubber. Midgley died unexpectedly at his home in Worthington, Ohio, in 1944 at the age of 55. He had made a lift using rope, bars, and a trapeze to help him move from his bed to his wheelchair and back. On November 2nd of that year, he was found entangled in it, strangled by the rope. People who knew him seemed to have been divided over whether they thought this was an accident or intentional. His death certificate lists his cause of death as suicide, and after an autopsy, Franklin County Coroner John B. Gravis came to the same conclusion. During his lifetime and after his death, Thomas Midgley Jr. was a deeply respected researcher and chemist. He received multiple awards from the American Chemical Society and the Society of Chemical Industry, along with the Franklin Institute's Longstreth Medal and various honorary doctorates. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Chemical Society, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Society of Automotive Engineers, and the American Society for Testing Materials. And he held 117 patents. And today we know that his two most famous inventions were destructive to the environment and to human health. Ethyl gasoline had also come to market in spite of serious concerns about its safety. And we will be talking about that after we pause for a sponsor break. As we said at the top of the show, today leaded gasoline is banned around the world, although it still does have a couple of limited uses, including in some types of aviation fuel. But leaded fuel is no longer sold to people just gassing up their cars and trucks, at least not legally. Most new cars cannot use it. The end of leaded gasoline is astonishingly recent, though. Algeria was the last nation to use up the last of its leaded gas, and that happened in July of 2021. The United Nations issued a statement that the global phase-out of leaded gas was finally finished on August 30th of that year, so this episode is coming out only a year later. The global move away from leaded gasoline took decades. Japan was the first nation to ban it. That was in 1980. In the U.S., the Environmental Protection Agency mandated leaded gasoline be phased out in 1973, but it didn't ban the use of leaded fuel in on-road vehicles until 1996. A lot of discussion during that whole process, starting in the 80s and 90s, made it sound like we had only just figured out that leaded gasoline was hazardous. That was not true. 
the reason that leaded gasoline was first marketed as ethyl gasoline was that everybody knew that lead was dangerous. Yes, lead does have some very important uses, including things like radiation shielding, but connections between lead exposure and physical and mental health problems go back thousands of years. They were incredibly well-documented in medical literature by the 19th century, We just had our episode on Alice Hamilton, who was one of the founders of the field of occupational health as a Saturday classic, and her groundbreaking work on the hazards of lead exposure in the workplace started a decade before Thomas Midgley Jr. tried putting tetraethyl lead in gasoline. Tetraethyl lead was also even more hazardous than a lot of other lead compounds because it could be inhaled. Midgley and other people connected to this research were aware of this. Ethyl Gasoline Corporation was founded in 1923, bringing together General Motors, which owned the patent on tetraethyl lead as a fuel additive, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and DuPont, which ran the manufacturing operation. A year later, Pierre DuPont wrote a letter to his brother Irene, in which he described tetraethyl lead as, quote, a colorless liquid of Swedish odor, very poisonous if absorbed through the skin, resulting in lead poisoning almost immediately. Charles Kettering described Midgley's work with Ethyl Gasoline Corporation as being focused on, quote, overcoming the prejudice against the new product, which arose from the fear that the use of lead in gasoline would poison people. Yet, Midgley had to take a month off work in early 1923 because he had developed acute lead poisoning, and three of his co-workers reported symptoms of lead poisoning as well. Beyond that, Midgley and Kettering received multiple letters from researchers at prominent universities and institutions, including Harvard and Yale, warning them of the potential dangers of using lead in gasoline. As one example, Dr. Eric Krauss of the Institute of Technology in Potsdam, Germany, had worked extensively with tetraethyl lead. He had this to say, quote, The compounds seem to possess, even in very reduced doses, the malicious and creeping poisonous effects, which are possessed by inorganic lead compounds. They do not produce the typical symptoms of lead poisoning, but a slow weakening and enfeebling of the whole body, which ultimately results in death. Frequently, the effects of poisoning appear only after a long latent period. I have used every possible means of precaution. Nevertheless, I think that I have severely damaged my health. So he wrote this in a letter that was forwarded around a little bit before being forwarded to Midgley in December of 1922. Despite the well-known hazards of lead exposure, General Motors wanted to introduce ethyl gasoline to the market as soon as possible. So production started in 1923, before adequate ventilation and other safety measures were installed at the factories where it was being made. Workers mixed and moved tetraethyl lead in open buckets, and one worker described people using their bare fingers to check its clarity. At least one worker died in the first month of production, and workers nicknamed the product loony gas because working around it seemed to cause things like confusion, agitation, sleeplessness, and even delirium. Yeah, the company later claimed this was made up by journalists to defame their product when it had really been coined by the workers having to produce it. The U.S. Surgeon General requested some testing, and that testing started through the Bureau of Mines, also in 1923. The tests were carried out in collaboration with General Motors. They involved exposing various animals to exhaust. The Bureau issued a report in October of 1924 describing the risk to the public from breathing in this exhaust as negligible. But a scathing response to this report was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. One of its authors was Alice Hamilton, and it pointed out many flaws in this research, calling it, quote, inadequate in scope, in technique, and in conclusiveness. Meanwhile, around the same time, the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service did six months of experiments with tetraethyl lead to see if it was suitable as a chemical warfare agent and found it to be dangerous. A report from Edgewood Arsenal called it, quote, probably the only compound where acute lead poisoning follows absorption through the skin. In 
and describing less than lethal doses having a cumulative effect on test subjects. Also in October of 1924, the same month that Bureau of Mines report came out, seven workers died at a standard oil plant in Byway, New Jersey, and more than 30 others developed symptoms of acute lead poisoning. Some of them developed a lifelong violent psychosis requiring permanent hospitalization. Other deaths and cases of lead poisoning took place at multiple DuPont and GM plants between 1923 and 1925. But the companies involved maintained that these were cases of worker error or production issues that were then corrected, and that improved ventilation and safety procedures would fix the problem at the factories. They also maintained that tetraethyl lead was safe at the concentrations that the public would encounter. Midgley seemed to genuinely believe this, and at one press conference in 1924, washed his hands in leaded gasoline as a safety demonstration, even though he had had lead poisoning himself the previous year. Meanwhile, the general public and various officials were outraged and alarmed over what was happening to workers at the fuel factories. The state of New Jersey and the cities of New York and Philadelphia all banned the sale of leaded gasoline. Kettering and Midgley were both removed from their leadership roles at the company in April of 1925, although GM CEO Alfred P. Sloan was quoted as saying that Midgley, quote, was entirely inexperienced in organization matters, kind of implied that this firing was unrelated to the backlash against his invention. He's just a bad administrator. Not a good fit. Uh... (laughs) They still had jobs at the company. They just were not in leadership roles anymore. Right. Just after this, Ethel Gasoline Corporation suspended the sale of leaded gasoline pending a public health review. The U.S. Surgeon General appointed a committee to carry this review out. During a conference held on May 20th, 1925, the fuel industry maintained that tetraethyl lead was the best and only solution to the knock problem, while public health experts insisted that it was dangerous and that the industry needed to find another way. During this conference, Alice Hamilton reportedly called Charles Kettering a murderer. Ultimately, the Surgeon General's committee reported that, quote, there are at present no good grounds for prohibiting the use of ethyl gasoline with a composition specified as a motor fuel, provided that its distribution and use are controlled by proper regulation. But the committee also noted that this could change with a rise in the number of vehicles on the road and recommended further studies supervised by the Surgeon General to account for these shifts, and how much leaded gasoline was actually being used. Those follow-up studies didn't happen, though. And according to the Department of Transportation, the number of registered motor vehicles in the United States roughly doubled over the next two decades. Ethyl gasoline returned to market on May 16, 1926. Over that year-long pause, the Ethyl Gasoline Corporation and DuPont had made safety changes and ventilation upgrades at their factories. Thanks to strict manufacturing and distribution rules, the following years did not see the kinds of deaths and injuries to workers that had taken place earlier in the 1920s. Leaded gasoline became standard in much of the world. By 1936, it made up 90% of the gasoline sold in the United States. The Surgeon General also approved an increase in the amount of tetraethyl lead in gasoline from 3 milliliters per gallon to 4 in 1959. A few years later, a widespread movement against leaded gasoline started to evolve in the United States and worldwide. This was inspired in part by Rachel Carson's 1962 Silent Spring and that book's influence on the environmental movement. Another factor was a series of deadly smog incidents that had taken place in multiple cities around the world starting around the 1930s. This included the Great London Smog and the Donora Smog, both of which we have covered on the show before. An increasing body of scientific work suggested that air pollution was a serious threat to people's health. Research in multiple cities also found high levels of lead in the air, with public health research going on at the same time suggesting that lead was harming people. There's actually a whole hypothesis that the increase in atmospheric lead in the middle of the 20th century contributed to an increase in crime in the United States in the 1970s, 
and that the ban on leaded fuel then contributed to a drop in crime rates starting in the 1990s. That is very hard to pin down specifically because a lot of other stuff was happening across those same years. But at the same time, it was very obviously clear that inhaling a bunch of lead all the time was causing problems. And it was causing most problems for often the poorest people who were living in really congested parts of cities. It's infuriating. Mm -hmm. Nations started passing anti-pollution and clean air legislation, including things like the Clean Air Act of 1970 in the United States. These laws included things like mandatory reductions in the amount of pollutants in car exhaust. In the U.S., the specific focus was a reduction in carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and other hydrocarbons, which led to the development of the catalytic converter. The catalytic converter reduced those pollutants in car exhaust, but it also could not be used in a car that was running on leaded gasoline because the lead in the gasoline would destroy the catalysts in the converter. So from the car industry's perspective, that was a much bigger driver in the phase-out of leaded gasoline than lead's dangers to public health. GM announced that catalytic converters would be installed in all of its new automobiles in 1970. General Motors and Standard Oil had already sold Ethel Corporation by that point. That happened in 1962. Leaded gasoline was gradually phased out and banned around the world over the decades that followed. Although there were exceptions, in general, wealthy countries made the switch first, while leaded gasoline continued to be marketed and sold in other parts of the world, with most of the last nations to make the switch being in the Middle East and Africa. The UN Environment Program started a campaign to eliminate leaded gas worldwide in 2002, and as we said at the top of the show, that was finally accomplished just last year as we're recording this in 2021. And one last infuriating thing before we move on, tetraethyl lead wasn't the only anti-knock agent being evaluated in the United States in the 1920s. Another was ethyl alcohol, or ethanol, which is in most unleaded gasoline today and was actually already in use in some parts of the world while leaded gasoline was being developed. Thomas Midgley Jr. and Thomas Boyd looked into ethanol in the 1920s, They knew that in a lot of ways it was superior to tetraethyl lead. It had similar anti-knock properties, and since it was made from fermenting sugars or grains, it was renewable. Ethanol can certainly have negative health effects. Ethanol is what's in alcoholic beverages. We know there are risks that come along with that, but as a fuel additive, it is not nearly as toxic as lead. But this was also during the Prohibition era, and although industrial alcohol wasn't prohibited, this still presented some challenges. General Motors also had a patent on tetraethyl lead as a fuel additive, but not on ethanol, meaning there was a lot more profit potential for the company with leaded gasoline. The petroleum industry was also concerned about the possibility of ethanol overtaking petroleum as a fuel source. So through all the controversy and hearings in the 1920s, fuel companies were insisting that there was no alternative to lead, even though they knew that there was. So let's take a break and maybe go find a pillow to scream into, because that was infuriating. The story of Thomas Midgley Jr.'s development of dichlorodifluoromethane, or Freon, and its eventual phasing out is somewhat less infuriating, at least to me, than the tetraethyl lead saga, because the damaging effects of Freon were not known until long after his death, and the response to finding out about how damaging it was was a lot quicker. While he was living, Freon really did seem like a vastly better option than the toxic or flammable gases that were in use as refrigerants. For example, in 1929, several people died as a direct result of refrigerant leaks, including a cluster of incidents in Chicago. Sometimes this is cited as the reason that Midgley was looking for a better refrigerant, but he actually developed Freon in 1928. That work was not announced until 1930, though, so that may be partially to blame for the confusion about why he started working on it. 
Midgley's actual process for making this discovery is a little bit vague. He was working at GM, which owned Frigidaire, and Frigidaire was looking for a new refrigerant. Midgley reportedly developed Freon as a refrigerant over the span of only three days. He was focused on compounds that included fluorine, starting with carbon tetrafluoride. He thought it was promising because of its boiling point of minus 127.8 Celsius. He also looked at at least one other chlorofluorocarbon. That was dichloromonofluoromethane, before focusing on dichlorodifluoromethane. Dichlorodifluoromethane was marketed as Freon-12. Similarly to the establishment of Ethyl Gasoline Corporation, Kinetic Chemicals was founded to manufacture this substance. That was through a partnership between General Motors and DuPont. Midgley became one of the company's directors. Soon, Freon was being widely used in refrigerators and in the first home air conditioners. Again, there's more on that in our History of Air Conditioning episode that came out in August of 2018. Based on what was known at the time, Freon was unquestionably better than other alternatives. It was non-flammable, non-toxic, stable, and essentially odorless. Midgley would demonstrate its safety by inhaling a big lungful of it and exhaling it to blow out a candle, something that probably would have seriously injured or killed him if he tried it with earlier refrigerants. That doesn't mean it was a great idea. We've already established that he intentionally exposed himself to things to demonstrate their safety when it wasn't necessarily safe. Other chlorofluorocarbons and hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs and HCFCs, followed, along with other applications for them. During World War II, Freon was found to be particularly effective for dispersing insect repellents, Soon, CFCs were being used as propellants in things like hairsprays. At this point, scientists knew the ozone layer existed. Charles Fabry and Henri Buisson had measured it for the first time in 1916. They and others started studying it, and in 1956, scientists started taking ongoing measurements at the Halley Bay Observatory on Antarctica. The rise of things like commercial air travel and the space race led to a bigger focus on the ozone layer as researchers wondered whether emissions from those vehicles would affect the atmosphere. By the 1970s, data from the Halley Bay Observatory and from satellites showed that the ozone layer was being depleted, but it wasn't yet clear why. Then in 1974, Mario Molina and F. Sherwood Rowland published a paper in the journal Nature titled Stratospheric Sink for Chlorofluoromethanes, Chlorine Atom Catalyzed Destruction of Ozone. This paper explained that chlorofluoromethanes, which are a type of hydrochlorofluorocarbon, destroyed atmospheric ozone. In 1995, Molina and Roland were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work, along with Paul Critzen, whose work was focused on the ozone-depleting ability of nitrogen oxides. Although air and space travel had been seen as potential threats before this point, this research revealed that common household products were a serious problem. CFCs and HCFCs used as propellants in spray bottles, in refrigerators and air conditioning systems, and in plastic foams. These compounds were both inert and volatile, which meant they could be carried high into the atmosphere unchanged. Once they were there, though, UV light broke them down, releasing chlorine into the upper atmosphere, where it acted as a catalyst to break down the ozone layer. Molina and Rowland predicted that if CFC use continued at the rate that it was going, eventually the ozone layer would be entirely depleted. The ozone layer helps protect the Earth from UV radiation, and without it, experts predicted sharp increases in things like cataracts and fatal skin cancers, as well as damage to crops and ecosystems that are sensitive to UV light. This was cause for alarm, and some places started putting limits on CFCs and HCFCs in the 1970s and early 80s. A conference was also convened in Vienna, Austria, and on March 22, 1985, 20 nations signed the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer. 
This included most of the nations where most of the world's CFCs were being produced. This convention set up a framework for nations to work together to try to address this problem. It focused on things like information sharing and research, rather than on taking specific actions to keep the layer from depleting any further. On May 1st, 1985, a team led by Joseph Farman at the British Antarctic Survey published another paper in the journal Nature, this one reporting that the ozone layer over Antarctica was already significantly depleted. This depletion was so dramatic that Farman at first thought his instruments were malfunctioning. This heavily depleted area over Antarctica became known as the hole in the ozone layer. But there were other proposed causes for this depletion besides CFCs and HCFCs, and additional research had to be done to confirm what was going on. Then, in 1987, the Antarctic Airborne Ozone Expedition took measurements high in the atmosphere, which showed that if there was more chlorine monoxide in an area, there was also less ozone. So it was clear that global action was needed to reduce the production and use of ozone-depleting substances like CFCs and HCFCs. Building on that framework that had been set up in the Vienna Convention, nations came together again, this time in Montreal in 1987. On September 16th of that year, 46 countries signed on to the international treaty that came to be known as the Montreal Protocol, Its terms included a phasing out of the production and use of several types of ozone-depleting chemicals, setting a target of reducing them to 50% of 1986 levels by 1999. Less wealthy countries were allowed a grace period to make the transition, and since then, the treaty has been amended to completely ban a range of ozone-depleting substances. The Vienna Convention and the Montreal Protocol are the only international treaties that have been signed by every member state of the United Nations. Many ozone-depleting substances were completely phased out around the world in the 1990s and early 2000s, and the few that remain are scheduled to be phased out by 2040. The ozone layer has already started to recover, and it is estimated that it will be entirely restored by 2050. So when you hear somebody say something like, remember when everybody was freaking out about the ozone layer and now we never hear a thing about that anymore? Kind of implying that it was some kind of manufactured panic and maybe we can just disregard other alarming reports about things like climate change. The reason we don't hear about it anymore is because the world actually came together to take action to address and fix this problem definitively. It can be done. (laughs) It can especially be done when there are alternatives that exist that are maybe only a little bit more expensive and you don't have an entire industry spreading a whole lot of disinformation saying that climate change isn't real. What? Yeah, that's crazy Uh, talk. Hey, do you have a listener mail? I sure do. (laughs) Uh, This listener mail is from Abby, who sent a note that is titled, OMG Diaryl Man. (laughs) And Abby started by saying, dearest historians, and then the the first paragraph of the email has some various personal details, but uh, Abby talks about wanting to be a history major because Abby's parents um, assumed that history majors all became teachers um, and did not think that Abby would have the patience to really be a teacher. They discouraged that line of education. But now uh, Abby has become a, a an avid listener to the podcast. So... Now on to the actual actual reason I'm writing. I've been a pharmacist for the last 15 years, both at the at a retail pharmacy and now as a hospital pharmacist. While I was in school, I discovered a way to meld my love of science and history by studying medical history. My university actually had a history of pharmacy elective, and it was taught by the most delightful professor ever. In addition to being a PhD in pharmaceutics and a pharmacist, he was also a veteran of World War I, He was a pharmacist in the Battle of the Bulge. I love to hear his stories of pharmacy during the war, especially the way the army recycled penicillin to share with the French civilians. This professor introduced me to the wonders of medical history items available on eBay and gave me my first antique medical book. Since then, my collection has grown to fill several bookshelves and photos covering the walls of my office. 
When you mentioned the diaryl man in the hypertension episode, I literally jumped up from my sewing machine. I'm a nerdy quilter too and went directly to the internet. I'm proud to say I found one and he's on his way to me now. Although drug companies have stopped making and sharing Chotsky's in the last 10 or 15 years, I always loved when we would get a new set of fancy drug pens notepads, or counting trays. My favorite item I've collected was a pen for the little blue pill that folded in half, and when you needed to use it, you pushed a button on the end, and it very comically flipped open in a rather slow and hilarious manner. I'm sure that someone on the Pfizer marketing team was very proud of that one. I'm not sure if I should thank you or not for educating me on the possibility to expand my collection to uh, include drug rep paraphernalia or not, but I'm now on the hunt for other antique finds like Diarrhea Man, I also want to thank you for the rabies episode earlier this year. Thank you for sharing the stories of why we pretty much treat anyone who comes in contact with bats in the U.S. I made sure to share the information with the pharmacy staff because my hospital has several emergency room visits every year for bat exposures, and we almost always end up administering rabies vaccines and immune globulin shots. It was always crazy to my fellow pharmacists and me about why so many people go to the ER when they just have a bat in their house or they accidentally touched a dead bat outside. We often thought people were being overly dramatic, especially when we had a family of eight come in and all needed treatment because we had to call all over the state to get enough vaccine. While I can confirm that the rabies series is a lot of vaccinations, four of them over 14 days, the urban legend stories of the need to use giant needles for shots in the belly is false. But it is quite uncomfortable when there is a bite because we have to inject the immune globulin in small amounts all around the bite location. And since doses of immune globulin are based on the patient's weight, it can sometimes end up being a lot of pokes. Uh, apologies for such a long email, but I have attached kitty pictures as penance. Uh, these kitties are adorable. Kitties, yes. Um, since, uh, as we said, Abby is a pharmacist, these are named after her antibiotics. Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say this wrong, moxifloaxin. That's probably right. Ma- moxie. And that's a gray tabby. Oh, no, that's an orange tabby. And then the gray tabby is lincomycin or link. Um, I love naming naming the kitties after antibiotics. I think that's great. So number one, I got this email and I love that somebody else was like, I'm going to go get a diarrheal man. And I'm I'm like, our eBay sellers like, why is everybody suddenly <laughs> want diarrheal man? <laughs> I love my diarrheal man. Uh, yeah, Holly already got a diarrheal man. Um, the other thing was, I had to go look up and see how the army recycled penicillin I had an idea in my head of how probably that happened, and that idea was the correct idea. Uh, And I'm not going to go into detail about it right now because it's a little gross for more squeamish people. But uh, I realized, even though I was sure we had, like, a penicillin episode, I don't actually think we do. We have other antibiotic stuff. I'll double-check. If we don't have a penicillin episode, we probably should. Yeah. Uh, Because the oversimplified children's book story of how penicillin was developed is not, as is often the case, not not really. It's cute. Uh, <laughs> it is very cute. It's not very complete, though. Uh, so thank you again, Abby, for this email and for the cat pictures. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com. If you're going to write to us to say that climate change is not real, just keep that to yourself because that's incorrect. Uh, We are on the iHeartRadio app, wherever else you like to get your podcasts. And we hope you'll tune in next time. Haven't scared you away with our climate talk. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. (laughs) 